Since the invention of items, there have always been dirty little thieves who want to steal said items. Robbers take the money. Amy Schumer take the funny. We take the Jerry Seinfeld bee's honey. And the Mexicans took our jibs. They took your jibs. They took your jibs. Yeah. Took your jibs. Want a thing? Don't have that thing? Easy solution. Three steps. Find someone who has thing. Take the thing profit. Not all these things are created equal, however. Some are personal, some are priceless, and some are just plain weird. It's group the third that we're going to be discussing today. So pull on a pair of stolen underwear and dig into that pilfered panini, because we're about to talk terrible thieves taking tremendously atypical things. People done been taking dead folk shit since dead people been dying, okay? Grave robbing has been commonplace since there were graves to rob. I really gotta stop saying that things have been happening since other things have existed. That's like the third time thus far. But people have been saying that things happen since other things have existed as long as there have been words to describe things happening and their relationship to other things having existed. <sighs> so, I guess I shouldn't worry about it too hard. Speaking of hard, uh, let's talk about the time somebody stole Napoleon's penis. That seems like a pretty good place to start, yeah. Wow, two videos in a row pertaining to a famous person's cock. Evan, are you just the, the famous person's cock channel now, you may be asking? Yes. Yes, I am. Here's a quote from Napoleonic penis expert Tony Petitet, a man with both too many R's and too many T's in his name. Like, seriously, are you French? Are you Spanish? What do I do here? Do I, I don't know whether to roll my R's or to kill myself. Whenever someone implies that history is boring, I bring up Napoleon's penis. And if anyone is qualified to make this statement, it's this man. He basically wrote the book on Napoleon's penis. In fact, he did. He did write the book on Napoleon's penis. It is called Napoleon's Privates, 2500 Years of History Unzipped. That's pretty clever. I like that. Buy it on Audible or something. Audible, please, please sponsor me. Think of how many listeners you could be getting off this Napoleon's penis bit. This man loves Napoleon's penis. He craves Napoleon's penis. He lives, eats, shits, and breathes Napoleon's penis. Despite this, I am just going to go off this Wikipedia article simply titled Napoleon's penis. Both because that's hilarious, and I am not going to read a 256-page book about a dead dude's dick. Although, little tangent here, I was researching this video at work, and someone came by only to notice that I had this Napoleon's penis Wikipedia page pulled up. Not to mention the other six tabs I had opened that had some variation of the long and twisted tale of Napoleon's penis in the title. Needless to say, if you have any positions open for janitor at your local Wendy's, please forward them to me, because I can, I can never go back. The aforementioned long and twisted tale of Napoleon's penis begins with his death in 1821. I guess technically it starts with his birth, but we do not care about his penis while it was alive for these purposes. I don't think it was very interesting. I sure hope it wasn't long and twisted either. Oh, you stink! During Napoleon's autopsy, the doctor removed the man's penis, swiftly passing it to Napoleon's priest like a rugby player with a mini corn dog. Some might say that he really took Napoleon's bone apart. Oh, you stink! What? It is theorized that the priest may have bribed the doctor to give him the penis as revenge for Napoleon one time calling the priest impotent. Which I think we can all agree is some pretty top tier revenge for that. Oh, impotent am I? Unable to maintain an erection I can't, hmm? Never fully able to satisfy a woman's sexual desires, aren't I? Mm -hmm. Well, now I have your dick, so who can't maintain an erection now? The priest then smuggled the penis off the prison island where Napoleon died off to his home in Corsica. How did he smuggle said item? Who's to say? Really. Where do people typically put things when they want to smuggle them somewhere? It's the ass. The priest successfully returned to France and was then pretty immediately killed in a bizarre and mysterious blood feud, apparently. After his death, the penis was inherited by the priest's family, who kept it for nearly a hundred years until it was sold in 1916 to a London-based bookselling company called Mags Bros LTD. Limited time dick. Long term dick. What they did with it for the next eight years, I haven't the slightest idea. I don't know what a book company does with a hundred-year-old French emperor's disembodied penis, but whatever it was that they were doing, they must have gotten pretty bored of doing it, because they sold it again in 1924 to, uh, Abraham Simon Wolf Rosenbach, a man with a name much longer than the item he purchased. Interesting looking fellow. 
definitely seems like the kind of guy to go around buying penises. In 1927, it went on display in New York in the Museum of French Art. And while it definitely was French, I would describe it less as art and more as a hundred-year-old disembodied penis. You know, different strokes for different folks. I mean, I would have bought a ticket. Just be accurate about what you're selling, you know, maybe put it in the French disembodied penis museum next time. It was then sold to a Donald Hyde, whose wife gave it to a John F. Fleming after Hyde's death. It fumbled its way through a couple more hands before ending up in the possession of artifact collector John K. Latimer in 1977. Latimer paid $3,000 for it at the time, which is about 14 grand today. That is quite a bit more money than I personally have ever paid for dick, I tell you what. In addition to artifact collecting and writing books about Nazis, Latimer was also a very esteemed urologist. That's a dick doctor, folks. You can't make this shit up. Apparently he bought the penis to take it out of circulation because he was tired of people making fun of it. I guess he felt they weren't taking it seriously as a hundred year old stolen emperor's penis should be, of course. And he took it and he put it in a box and he hid it under his bed at his home in New Jersey. He refused anyone who asked to see it, forcing the penis into mysterious obscurity for decades as he solemnly slept above it. One of those brave few requesting to see the penis was our old friend and Napoleonic cock connoisseur, Tony Paratet. Remember him? You remember that guy? He was rejected at every turn. <laughs> After Latimer's death in 2007, he left the penis to his daughter, probably making him one of the only people in history to be able to say, I gave my dick to my daughter without just immediately going to prison. Apparently she's a lot more lax about the whole thing than her dad because she was the one who finally allowed Tony's dreams to come true. One day when they were at her house, John Latimer's daughter finally showed Tony her penis. It... It was beautiful. At this point, you may be wondering, what the hell does this thing even look like? I was too, and apparently the answer is nothing like a penis at this point. There are no surviving photos of its shriveled glory, but eyewitnesses that have been lucky enough to gaze upon it describe it as looking like a piece of leather, a shriveled eel, a maltreated piece of buckskin shoelace, a little baby's finger, and a bit like beef jerky. Yum. Tony describes it in this quote here. It was kind of an amazing thing to behold, you know. There it was, Napoleon's penis, sitting on cotton wool, very beautifully laid out, and it was very small, very shriveled, about an inch and a half long. Which, sure, is a little below average, but let's be fair to the guy, okay? It has been sitting, disconnected from his body, unprotected for 200 years. I don't think that there's a more reasonable case for shrinkage than that. Plus, come on guys, this is a flaccid measurement, okay? There hasn't been any blood in this cock since 87 years before World War I. Cut the guy some slack, I'm sure he was a grower. Definitely not a shower. I know me personally, my little guy goes from a, ve a very respectable 0.5 inches soft to a cool 17 and a half feet in the presence of your mother. That's longer than three twin-sized mattresses. She is a very lucky woman. You may also be wondering, just how much does a dead emperor's penis go for on the open market these days? Three Bitcoin? Four Bitcoin? Five Bitcoin? I don't know. I don't know how much Bitcoin is. But apparently Latimer's daughter has been offered over $100,000 for this little fella. That's more expensive than three twin size mattresses. She's a very lucky woman. I'm prepared to give you $500 for that penis. <laughs> Not so fast. I'll give you $1,000 for such a penis. <sighs> I'll give you $100,000 in cash for said penis. <laughs> Sir, I'll give you a million dollars for that penis. Okay, how many times did I say penis in the last, uh, insert amount of minutes? Oh, 36. Almost beat my personal record. Check out the big brain on bread! You may not know this, but Einstein gave dumb brain. I mean, Einstein gave smart brain to science. Except he didn't give it willingly. No, 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 no. No. This video is not titled Things Generously Given to Others with the Owner's Consent. Okay, it's, it's called Advanced Thievery, I think. Pretty sure that's gonna be the title. Either way, this thievery was advanced, okay? Almost as advanced as the brain Einstein gave to science.
Of course. Non-consensually. Einstein gave non-consensual brain to oh science. Oh my god! Now, we all know that Einstein was maybe ki kind of a little bit smart. No! Let's face it, this man was the sharpest knife in the drawer, the quickest Kenyan on the track, the brightest bulb in the Home Depot lighting department. And exactly because he was so smart, he knew that everyone and their mother was gonna try and take his brain and his eyes and his penis to study for science. And he did not particularly like the idea of getting chopped up and passed around like a roast ham on Christmas Eve. So he explicitly requested that his body be cremated and for his ashes to be spread in secret, or alternatively rolled and smoked by Joe Rogan. Despite his brain being good enough to know that it was in danger, it wasn't quite good enough to not have an aneurysm. And it went ahead and had one in the early morning hours of April 18th, 1955, which eventually led Einstein to die of heart failure. His autopsy was performed by a doctor named Steve Harvey. Oh, hey, hold on. It's not Steve Harvey? This is a really dumb bit. Yes. Yes, Mom. Yes, I took out the trash! His autopsy was performed by a doctor named Thomas Harvey. Now, I don't think that this guy necessarily knew that Einstein was so against being roast hammed. I really just think his supervisor probably came in that morning and said, Harvey, there's a dead Jew over there! Clean it up! Sir, that's no ordinary dead Jew. That is actually a very, quite intelligent, dead science Jew. Let's, uh, let's take his brain. So, they took his brain, along with, uh, his eyeballs, for some reason. They never got his penis. But it's what Harvey did next that starts to make the situation a bit more... sus. After he took the brain out, instead of maybe preserving it in the hospital or like calling the president or something, he just straight up took it home with him. Basically just wrapped it up in a doggy bag and took it home like it was Chinese leftovers. He actually put it in a jar with formaldehyde, but he still fucking kissed it goodnight and shit from the comfort of his own house. Like, who, who just takes organs home? So two days later, on 420, Joe Rogan showed up to the funeral to dispose of Einstein's ashes as requested. Before they cremated the body, though, Harvey pulled Einstein's son off to the side and was like, Hey man, uh, how, how's, how's it going? How are you doing? Well, I'm at my father's cremation, so today's not really all puppies and pussy for me. That's great. Listen up. You might be wondering why your father has a giant empty hole on the top of his head and has googly eyes where his regular human eyes used to be. You know, now that you mention it, that is a bit strange. Yeah, so basically I took his brain. You what? Whoa, whoa, slow down, cowboy. Settle down now. Listen, I took his brain. It's in my basement. Actually, yeah, that's pretty much it. How do you feel about that? Are you mad about that? Yes, I'm fucking mad about that. Okay, okay, simmer down now, cowpoke. I took it for science. Okay, never mind that it's in my basement, hanging out in a jar next to my home brewing machine and some real dolls. I took it for very professional reasons. This is all very above board. <sighs> well, I mean, if it's for science, you know, I suppose maybe, you know, that might possibly be okay. Thanks, man. Knew you'd understand. See ya. <laughs> By the way, a verbal agreement is legally binding in the state of New Jersey, okay? So, adios. <laughs> so after Einstein's son gave Harvey permission to get funky with his father's hoodwinked pink think machine, Harvey proceeded to give it a photo shoot and then chop it up into 240 pieces like a freshly purchased onion. <laughs> Yum. <laughs> Harvey then drove all around the country, handing out pieces of brain to researchers. He didn't just give the pieces to, you know, actual scientists, though, I mean, come on. This is the guy who took the thing home in a greasy doggy bag full of pad thai and pot stickers and plopped it next to Justine. Harvey would often brag to house guests that he had pieces of the brain and would give them out to peers and colleagues. Maybe as a memento? A little midnight snack, perhaps? Now, after Einstein's death in 1955, not a lot of people knew about all these shenanigans besides Einstein's family, Harvey himself, and the bajillions of people he was passing out pieces of the brain to willy-nilly. That all changed 23 years later in 1978 thanks to a particularly nosy journalist by the name of Stephen Levy. Levy worked for a magazine called the New Jersey Monthly. The editor read a biography on Einstein, which said that his body was cremated except for his brain, which was taken for science. The editor thought it was a little sus that it had been more than 20 years and nobody knew where the brain was or what quote unquote science was doing with it. So he pulled Levy up into his office and gave him a little recon mission. I want Einstein's brain. So Levy then went on a scavenger hunt, a wild goose chase, if you will, full of wacky antics and celebrity guests, until he finally tracked down Harvey and went to meet with him. And surprisingly, for a guy who stole a famous nerd man's brain and has been slowly passing out chunks of it as housewarming gifts, 
Harvey was like, yeah, I've got the brain man. Come check it out. Let me just, let me just move a couple things here. Oh, there it is right here in my beer cooler. Actually, that does kind of sound like this guy. He probably offered Levy a piece of the brain just for asking about it. So Levy outed this guy for his reckless brain endangerment. And it was pretty big news for a couple of seconds until everybody promptly forgot about it a couple of seconds later. Eventually, in the 80s, some studies were released on the pieces of the brain, and after Harvey died, his family took the remaining pieces that survived Harvey just shooting them out at people like a t-shirt cannon, and they took them and they gave them to the National Museum of Health and Medicine where they still soak today. So after all this, you may be wondering with those puny little normal people brains of yours, was there anything actually different about Einstein's brain? Uh, yeah. Uh-huh. There was. The German people are known for many things. Things such as Oktoberfest, Lederhosen, ethnic cleansing. They're also known for some damn good quality chocolate. I think. It sounds like something they'd be famous for. If someone said that they bought German chocolate, I assume that that person can afford rent this month. Ooh, jealous. I'm, I'm jealous of that. Then again, you could really say that you have anything from Europe and people would think that it's fancy. I mean, you could be like, you know, Edgar, I, I don't know if you've heard, but I actually have hepatitis. Oh, gross. No, 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 you don't understand. It's Italian hepatitis. I got it in a quaint little village outside Tuscany. Oh, classy. Still though, next time you come over, please bring your own cups. I have children. What I'm getting at is that some people really want German chocolate. In fact, some people are willing to, let's say, steal an entire cargo truck full of German chocolate to get German chocolate. Why? Probably so they can seem like they can actually afford to pay their rent this month. In 2013, a truck full of 20 tons of German-based chocolate products, including 11 tons of Nutella, vanished like D.B. Cooper into the night. Or maybe the evening. Mid-afternoon. I don't know what time of day it was, but it disappeared. Now, most people do agree that it was stolen, but I don't think we should jump to conclusions just yet, okay? We could be looking at a possible alien abduction, a wormhole, maybe even a Sathura type situation. At this time, the German government does not buy into my current theory that Joe Rogan rolled and smoked the truck just like Einstein's ashes, and they have released a statement saying, anyone offered large quantities of chocolate via unconventional channels should report it to to the police immediately. Oh wow, impressive Nutella collection you have here, Bill. Where, where did this all come from? I don't know, my dealer won't tell me where he gets it. They still haven't captured these particular hazelnut bandits, but this it was not the only time that massive quantities of Nutella have been taken through illegitimate means. In 2016, a Canadian gang which kind of sounds like an oxymoron, led by a man known as the Canadian King of Car Thieves, which is kind of like saying the Mexican head of space and aeronautics, space, he, fly, was caught with $30,000 worth of stolen Nutella, as well as stolen guns, vapes, alcohol, luxury cars, weed, cocaine, and heroin, but who cares about any of that shit? That is child's play compared to where the real money's at. Black market dessert spreads. People say if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. What they don't say is if you bake it in New York, someone might steal it in their underwear. In the early morning hours of May 19th, 2014, a supple young delivery boy hops out of a Grimaldi's home of bread delivery truck with a glimmer in his eye and a shit ton of dough in his arms. He breathes in that toxic plume of acetylene that is the Upper East Side, and he makes his first delivery of the day to a local pizzeria. At that very same time, a man named David Tar was engaging in a very sacred New York City pastime, roaming the streets in your underwear screaming. And as the rest of the city passed by him, trying their best not to make direct eye contact, except of course for the other underwear-clad men screaming in the street, they like to wink at each other, David spotted an extravagant opportunity to engage in some unrestricted Florida man-type antics an unguarded and running bread truck. David proceeded to hop in the bread truck and drive around Manhattan, passing out the bread as if he were a modern day Robin Hood. The Robin Hood that takes from the rich and gives to the poor, not, not the Robin Hood that takes from the autistic and gives to the hedge fund conglomerates. David spent the next few hours slinging sourdough, peddling pumpernickel, and redistributing the rye until the bread was gone and his mission was complete. David then breathed a sigh of relief, 
hit the crack pipe for which he stores under his balls, and then proceeded to tailgate a random car for several miles until he was arrested at LaGuardia Airport, presumably trying to steal a plane and fly to Tallahassee to be with his own kind. This story just proves the age-old adage, if you believe in yourself, you can accomplish anything. Or, that's not it. Is it, uh, aim for the moon, shoot for the stars? Oh, wait, yeah, it's don't leave your truck running because a man in his underwear will steal it and then pass out all of its contents to the people of Manhattan. Despite the fact that the average Redditor wastes about eight and a half gallons of it a year on his body pillow alone, semen can actually be quite valuable. Thoroughbred horse semen is actually the most expensive liquid on the planet. A gallon of splooge from gold medal winning stallion Big Star is valued at $4.7 million. Not pesos, not yen, 4.7 million United States dollars or come. Horse, horse come. Which begs the question, why in the hell aren't we all out there jacking off horses right now? I mean, how hard can it be? Rise and grind? More like rise and jack off a horse. You could be making a down payment on a house in like a week. Although not quite as expensive as Big Star's Nutter Butter, bull semen can still fetch quite a pretty penny. However, I did find out, thanks to this enlightening post titled, The Value of Bull Semen versus Human Semen posted to r slash they did the math, eight years ago by user Boob Rockets, donated human sperm pound for pound is actually worth quite a bit more than that of a bull and is actually worth more by weight than gold. So seriously, go start scraping that body pillow like now. That is money on the table. Despite this, instead of scraping their body pillows or going out and jacking off a horse for their cum money like a good law-abiding citizen, some do decide to turn to the dark side to pad their spunk fund. Such was the case on January 24th, 2016, when a California farmer's truck was robbed for all the dairy cream it's got, $50,000 worth of frozen bull semen. The farmer's name was Anthony Reese. And as a journalist from CBS writes in what is probably the funniest quote I've ever heard from mainstream news, Reese had spent months collecting that semen. Just imagine that. Months. Months of living like a professional tugger at a discount Chinese massage parlor, handing out happy endings day in and day out to bulls for, for m months. And for what? You leave the truck unlocked for five minutes to deliver some bull semen to your local pizzeria and Joe Rogan waltzes in and smokes it all. A quote from the farmer himself. You're trying to make a living. The loss of all those units of semen and probably taken by someone who had no idea what they were stealing is very frustrating. Before I read that, it hadn't even occurred to me that the jism thieves might not have even known what it was that they were stealing. I'm just picturing like the truck robbery mission in GTA. They pull open the doors and Franklin's like, man, what the hell? Why is this truck full of milk? Gross. This milk must be spoiled or something. And then Trevor's like, hey, that's not milk. That's bull semen. I'd know that smell anywhere. <laughs> Tastes expensive, too. This is a good score. Now, you may think, wow, $50,000 a bull semen? Wowee, that must be the biggest bull semen robbery to date, right? Well, Ripley's Believe It or Not, you would be wrong, because the Guinness Book of World Record for the largest bull semen heist is held by a $70,000 sperm napping that happened a year earlier in April 2015. Apparently, the thieves just walked into an unlocked barn and milking room and stole four pints of the stuff out of a $500 sperm specialized bull semen storage vessel. And they still haven't caught these guys yet, which I think is kind of messed up. You know, these cops need to stop single-handedly propping up their small town donut shop and relate to the plight of these humble jizz farmers. You know, somebody steals an eight-year-old girl and suddenly everybody's on high alert. Where's little Susie? Where's our little baby girl? We need to bring these sick monsters to justice, damn it. This is our number one priority. Drop everything until we have the back this little girl. Leave no stone 
unturned, no white van unswatted, no sack unransacked. They're putting up signs and shit, combing through the woods like it's fuck, like it's Stranger Things. Where is all this fanfare when they steal a working man's hard-earned splooge? Fuck Susan, she's not worth fifty thousand dollars. Put a bounty out on these jizz bandits. Call the call the fucking National Guard. Reese had spent months collecting that semen. I'm not seeing any Amber Alerts about this. I I want to look at my phone and see if you see a beige Toyota Camry filled to the brim with vanilla gogurt. Please alert your local police department immediately. You know, I don't want to be the one to say it, but this country needs to get its damn priorities in check. All right, that's all I'm doing for this video. I found lots more tales of woe and whimsy like this, but I have talked about naked men and bread trucks and snipped off corpse cock and enough for today. I'll probably make another installment of these. If that's something you want to see, let me know in the comments. If it's not, say, say something down there, you know, call me a racial slur. <laughs> I really just want the engagement. I know nobody actually subscribes to things anymore. You just go on your homepage and let the algorithm do it because at this point, Google can squirt your favorite content down your throat with a baby bottle better than you could yourself. But just just tap the button. It's it's free. Forget about it. No, you, it's just a thumb movement. It's like one calorie. You do it all day when you scroll through TikTok looking at white men with broccoli haircuts shove eggs up their bunghole. Just do it like one more time before you use it on the next video, which also is hopefully one of mine. Uh, that'd be cool. That'd be that'd be crispy. Uh, if you're a fan of the famous peni content, check this one out. Wherever it is, uh, I've got a rundown on President uh, Lyndon B. Johnson's famous member. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, bye, okay.